Greetings. Steve had asked me to say a few words at his memorial service. Uh, my name is Dan Heskett. I first met Steve about maybe 15 years ago. I was on a bike ride with my son, who was probably 15, 16 years old then. And we were going out on Three Mile Drive, turning north on the farm to market when a cyclist from the other direction came. And a few moments later, he did a U-turn and caught up with us. He wasn't so interested in me, but he was interested in seeing a young guy out on a road bike. And so he introduced himself and we rode for a while together and he exchanged information with my son and then they started after that connecting and riding together. Uh, he was really interested in developing young riders to race and enjoy the sport. So the first time I met Steve is because he did a U-turn. About a month later, my family was on the Coeur d'Alene Trail in Idaho bicycling and way out in the distance we see a roller skier coming towards us. And who should it be but Steve? And we had this long time family joke because my wife couldn't remember Steve's last name. And at that time we were watching the Tour of France on TV and there was a racer in the tour named Steve Rasmussen. So after that, we always referred to Steve Muller as Steve Rasmussen, as in, well, I saw Rasmussen skiing today. And over the years, I ran into Steve frequently <clears throat> skiing. We would often ski together after he finished grooming. And I like to joke with him that, you know, the conditions would be much better, Steve, if you groomed at midnight to let the snow set up. And occasionally I cycled with him. But I really didn't know Steve until about three years ago when he called me and asked if he could come see me. So in addition to my love of such things as Nordic skiing and cycling, I am also a Lutheran pastor. I've served Northridge Lutheran Church in Kalispell for over 28 years. So Steve showed up and shared with me about his cancer diagnosis. And I told him that I would be there for him. And this began a three-year relationship where we met almost every week. And I simply wanted to be there for Steve, uh, give him time, give him compassion, and to be kind of a faith foundation for him. Uh, I can't obviously share much of the content of our conversations, but I want to share a few reflections about the end of Steve's journey on earth that I shared with him. As a pastor, I deal with death all the time. It's just a part of my daily work. And I've learned over the years that there is such thing there is such a thing as a good death and a good journey of dying as opposed to a troubled or chaotic death and dying process. And I want you to know that Steve had a good death. And what made it good is that he fully engaged in the journey. He engaged his body, mind, and soul. He did everything he possibly could to continue to live a good full life. And you know Steve. Um, nature invigorated him. Physical activities were life-giving to him. His diet was meticulous. And really through these three years, he did everything he could to regain his health and live a full active life. And during this time, he also leaned into the pain of face to face with no avoidance of dealing with his cancer. 
um, my relationship with Steve really focused on his emotional, spiritual journey. We talked deeply about his life. He shared about his family and his marriage, his fears, his hopes, his faith in God, the love he had for his grandchildren. He shared his uh, hopes and dreams for them. And one of his hopes for his grandchildren was simply that they enjoy, they would enjoy nature as much as he did. And when he felt good, we talked about fun stuff like skiing and hiking, photography, adventures. But mostly when Steve and I were together, we talked about the hard stuff. We sat together, uh, trusting each other uh, and dealing with the insidiousness of the illness. About a year ago, we began talking seriously about death um, and Steve did not avoid that or shy away from it. And I suggested that we talk about his funeral and even planning his funeral in advance, which he was willing to do and he did. Uh, basically, this memorial service was all designed and planned by Steve. Many people are afraid to talk about death or about their own funerals, but Steve engaged in it. We did some what I would call formal religious things that might be surprising to you. At one point, Steve was reflecting on his life and was troubled about some things of his life and if his past. So one day we met in our little prayer chapel in our church and we did a formal confession of sin. That Steve poured out his heart through me to God and I assured him of God's nature to forgive, accept, and love Steve as a child of God. It was a tremendously cleansing and freeing time for Steve. For some reason, I've <clears throat> saved a voice message that I received from Steve on January 24th. It was a Friday. Uh, Friday is my day off, so I missed his call because I was skiing. His message was almost inaudible because the brain cancer had so taken over. He just was kind of mumbling. But when I listened to the message, I called him right away and he answered the phone and I could hardly figure out what he was saying to me. But I said, Steve, I could come over now if you want. And there was an immediate change in his voice. You can, he said. And we talked briefly on the phone and his voice became very clear and understandable. And I share this because death is often a teacher for us. We can learn through death and dying of other people. And apparently what was so important to Steve at that moment was to know that he's not alone on his journey to know that there was somebody there for him in addition to Patty and his family, somebody who had compassion, care and love and concern for him. That's, that's all that was needed. And if we learn something from Steve's death, uh, this is certainly one thing, to be there for others, to care, to give them time and be compassionate. I think often of Steve, I have a couple of his photos on my desk of Glacier Park and Heron Park. <clears throat> and these are constant reminders of him. Every time I ski and hike, I think of Steve. And I think of the fact that it was a privilege and blessing for me to share these years and conversations with him. I'm grateful for this. Steve knew God. One time he shared a vision 
that he had about his life after death, and it was a beautiful vision. Sometimes I would share a scripture or a prayer of the church that I thought would speak to him, which he appreciated highly. So here's one prayer that we pray together as he neared the end of his life, and I would like to end with this prayer. O oh Lord, support us all the day long of this troubled life until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed, the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in your mercy, grant us safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. Amen. God's peace be with you, Steve. My name is Don Bowder, and I was a friend of Steve's for over 20 years. On a walk a couple months before Steve passed away, we were reminiscing and talking about life's inevitable conclusion, and I asked him if he was afraid of dying, and he replied that he wasn't. I don't believe Steve was a religious man, but rather derived his spirituality through nature. On that walk, he spoke of an afterlife experience of flying over Montana with the cranes, and he asked me if I would speak at his memorial. I told him I would be honored. I had hoped to have further walks where I could ask him how he wanted to be remembered. Sadly, I never had that opportunity. Though I don't remember exactly when we first met, I'm sure it was in 1997, and probably on a ski trail. 
We took up skate skiing about the same time, and we became obsessed with the, with the sport, spending hundreds, if not thousands, of hours together, enjoying each other's company, and perfecting our Nordic skills. Steve became a beautiful skier, and as we improved, he added ski racing to the list of many outdoor events we shared together, cycling, running, kayaking, and combinations of all of those. He was a serious competitor with many achievements, but was always humble, never boisterous, and understated about his accomplishments. Steve, and Steve was always up for a new challenge. We started kayaking about the same time. First, it was attainment paddling. Then he really got into flat water paddling, then flat water racing and triathlons, and multi-spurred adventure racing. And once again, he found success. We did lots of running as well, usually as an off-season ski training. One day, Steve talked me into going over to Helena for a team running cycling biathlon on McDonald Pass. As a former bike racer, I assumed I was going to be the cyclist, but Steve had other ideas. He was going to be on the bike. Another time, he suggested we go down to Bozeman for the John Coulter Adventure Run. The night before the race, rather than carbo load, he wanted to try a famous steakhouse nearby. Steve always did things his own way, preferring not to follow the crowd. Later, after he quit cycling competition, he became a very good runner, one I struggled to keep up with. Steve's involvement in cycling in the Flathead Valley, first through Flathead Velo, then Flathead Cycling, is legendary. He was passionate about cyclocross, and he was the force behind cyclocross racing in the Flathead Valley, almost single-handedly keeping the sport alive. One of my biggest regrets was not having the chance to race cyclocross with him, because just as it became my passion, he was ready to move on to new challenges. Steve was very adaptive, always trying to reinvent himself, and as he pursued new career interests, he became a groomer for our North Shore Nordic Club, up on Blacktail Mountain Nordic Trails. He was the best groomer we ever had. He strove for grooming Nirvana, beautiful uninterrupted corduroy, and perfectly formed classic track. Shortly after he started grooming for us, he came to me and a colleague who I shared grooming responsibilities on Steve's off days and suggested we have a meeting. He was concerned about the quality of our grooming and thought we needed to get on the same page, his page. And Steve was always running new grooming and improvement ideas by me. Wooden step Ginsu rests, cantilever jacks for easier implement attachment, etc., etc. Just about drove me crazy. But all his inventions we still use today. And through all these years of activities, he consumed and drank lots of coffee. Steve really loved coffee. I remember many times thinking, really, Steve, we have to stop for coffee again? I doubt there's a coffee kiosk in the valley he hasn't frequented. And his order was always the same, Americano. I had no idea what one was, but I do now and I love it. Thank you, Steve. Steve was a wonderful craftsman and took pride in his workmanship throughout the valley. He solved a clothesline dilemma for my wife, Rebecca, by designing and building a cantilevered version under a wooden deck that she now finds indispensable. It's a great example of how creative and ingenious he was. A few years back, Steve wanted to donate a framed print of one of his photographs for our North Shore Nordic Club Cylon Auction fundraiser. I didn't even know he was into photography, and I remember thinking at the time, Okay, that's fine, but don't be surprised if no one bids on it. It was, a wonder, it was wonderful, and of course it sold. And when he showed me his work, I was blown away. He truly had an eye for light and color and found his inspiration in his love of nature. Towards the end of, <clears throat> of his battle with brain cancer, Steve told me he was finished with the medical treatment for the disease and would let nature run its course. He was so concerned and saddened about what this battle was doing to Patty. Steve had a quiet passion for life. He was always dependable. He was focused, honest, and fair. He was a humble man and never touted 
his many successes. Patty recently wondered how Steve would have handled the coronavirus. I later mused, pre or post cancer, the former Steve wouldn't have missed a beat. Aside from a six foot roll of grocery store, he would have been unhindered by social distancing, continuing to trail run, kayak, hike, photograph, and even sneak into a shuttered glacier park. The latter Steve would probably have rolled his eyes and said, what's the point? Steve was a great friend and I miss him.
a bar room drinking your hand Looking for a woman who is looking for a man And that wants some love and then a one night stand Cause you're out looking for a good time Looking for a love and then a good time So you take a trip here and you take a trip there You think about her but you really don't care That your woman's at home waiting for you Cause you're out looking for a good time Looking for a love and then a good time Well a man needs a woman he can give his love to Someone who'll be there when the day is through She's at home waiting but it's nothing to you Cause you're out looking for a good time Looking for a love and then a good time And then the day finally comes when it is Life means more than a one-night prize You hurry on home, but she ain't there She's out looking for a good time She's looking for a love and then a good time Well, a man needs a woman he can give his love to Someone who'll be there when the day is through She's at home waiting, but it's nothing to you Cause you're out looking for a good time Looking for a loving and a good time